Good morning. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm Kimberly Collins. I am the executive director of the Leonard Transportation Center and your host for today. I have my colleague here, Rafi Derwartanian, um, and he is going to be helping out in the in the background. And if you need any assistance or anything, just please be able to email us during the event and we'll get back to you. I expect there's going to be others who are going to be coming in um, but we'll get started with our, with our session because I like to start right on time and end right on time. Um, to get us started, I'd like to bring forward first a great colleague and one of our main sponsors um, to this event, Greg Holsizer, who's a VP over at HNTV. Greg, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, on behalf of 5,000 of my colleagues across the country <clears throat> at, H at, HNT at HNTB, I want to welcome you this morning and thank you for attending. These are always so informative and, and so very interesting. So I'm really excited to hear what we, you know, to see what we uh, get to learn today. As I was thinking about this morning, maybe it was because I'm getting old, but I was thinking about when I first got into this business, we'd have a, we, if we had a call like this about transportation, we'd be talking about Oh, where we can add more asphalt, where we can pour more concrete, where we can add more lanes, I mean, that type of thing. The, the vocabulary we use today, integrated corridor management, you know, electrification, uh, first, last mile, it wasn't even, didn't even exist. So it's just incredible to me how far um, this transportation um, industry body of knowledge has come. And, and so I'm very excited to hear today about this about this topic of, of last mile. So um, I'll just turn it back over. Thank you for, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. Thank you, Greg. And it's great to see you this morning. Um, yes, again, welcome. We do have a really interesting program. Um, I'm going to admit, I know very little about the last mile. One of the reasons that we're having these three great folks um, as part of this conversation this morning we have uh, Scott Strelecki from uh, Southern California Association of Government. We have Bruce D.D. McRae, who's over at UPS, and Salim Youssef uh, Zalev, right? Salim, um, from uh, Watt EV. And so, again, I think it's going to be a great, a great, sh a great show today, a really interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to the discussion and the engagement that we'll have this morning. And I invite you all to engage. We really want this to be a dialogue. These, um, these sessions were designed for us to have discussions in the Inland Empire around key issues of transportation that impact our everyday lives and um, get the community involved, get the experts engaging with those of us who are not so expert um, to really, to really understand how our system's working and where we can find improvements um, and where, you know, things are working really well. So we should keep it going that way. Um, again, I, I'd like to welcome you. <clears throat> you can use the chat. So the chat should be open for you as well as um, um, we'll have time for question and answer at the end. We're gonna begin with a, a, a set of poll questions to get us thinking about the topic this morning. And so there's a series of three questions in our first poll questions. And so we'll answer these and then we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion about them. And then we'll begin with our first speaker. So within this set of questions, we have government should be the lead on deciding how last mile delivery functions. Um, and so that's within a five point Likert score. And our next one, our second one is business should be the lead on deciding how last mile delivery functions. And then of course our third one, because these are never really scientific or very difficult questions, <clears throat> government and, and business should be, uh, should work together on finding solutions to last mile um, delivery. So results, okay. okay. 
So we have government should be the lead. We have just a few saying agree. Some are neutral. Some are dis um, some are disagree. This one's a bit more neutral. Um, and then, of course, you know, our softball out there that government and business should be working together. And as a public policy professor, that's what I'm always trying to put forward is that we really need all of our sectors, government and business and the nonprofit um, working together to uh, to really create the solutions that we um, are looking for. Right, so we will start with our first speaker this morning, um, Scott Strelecki, who in addition to being our first speaker to really start us off and giving us the great data that he's put together over at SCAG, was also instrumental in helping to put together this panel. So I'd like to thank Scott very much for all of your assistance um, and, and, and hard work in, in getting this together. <laughs> Additionally, if you are interested in looking at the program for today, if, in addition to being in the invitation we sent out, Rafi has also put it into the chat, so you can pull up the program um, there. So let me just open up Scott's presentation here. And Scott, please, you're on. Okay, okay, yeah. So thank you so much, Kimberly, and, and thank you everyone for being here. Really appreciate the opportunity and Hopefully we get good engagement, good dialogue as is the intent of this uh, opportunity. So um, my name is Scott Strzelecki. I'm the program manager of the Goods Movement Business Unit at the Southern California Association of Governments um, or SCAG. Next slide, please. Uh, so for today, I'll be providing a brief review of SCAG's role in the region, including how we view last mile delivery. I'll also walk through some macroeconomic considerations to try to just you know, get a sense of where things are in the relationship um, and last mile related factors for the Inland Empire as a, as a kind of balance on that. And then at the end, I'll provide an update on SCAG's last mile freight program. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the Skag region is quite extensive when considering its breadth across multiple indicators. Uh, of note are the region's greater than 19 million residents, reflecting nearly 50% of the state total, 1.2 trillion in regional GDP, um, and ranking as 15th largest economy in the world. Uh, as part of Skag's long-range long planning efforts, the Goods Movement Business Unit focuses extensively on goods movement activities, collaborating with public-private freight stakeholders through numerous studies, projects, and programs, including specific work on last-mile freight dynamics. Next slide, please. So for SCAG, last mile delivery is a growing area that the agency continues to focus on. Uh, this is especially important as SCAG is tasked with projecting future trends associated with population and employment, uh, two areas that serve as drivers for consumption, as well as being part of the agency's focus um, on, tr of, on transportation facilities and infrastructure and the relationship to land use development. Uh, last mile delivery has been enabled by the increasing utility of the smartphone device. We're all familiar with that. Uh, consumers are now capable of making instantaneous purchasing decisions at any moment throughout the day. Uh, this has led to a circular flow of service requirements uh, for merchants tailoring towards consumer preferences and expectations uh, to cost level considerations, especially for merchants and freight capacity providers to, be, to consider and be capable of absorbing uh, to increasing supply chain complexity for how interchanges are made for goods from production to consumption. Uh, the last mile is increasingly becoming the norm and expectation for how consumers expect some portion of their goods to be provided. Next slide, please. And next one too. So the next few slides here, just wanna do a quick uh, walkthrough on some of the macro um, uh, elements of what's going on and just get a sense and how we can think about this, right, as it relates to last mile. So retail and food service sales are important to focus on um, as a subset of these sales correspond directly to the purchase of goods using last mile service, whether through e-commerce or omni-channel. Um, that's the key intent of the slide, but it's also valuable to recognize varying cycles to get a sense of what's happening today. So long-term trends have remained stable, but the current environment we are in since uh, the pandemic has been highly unique with respect to acceleration in performance. Um, typically, economic performance is measured by magnitude of growth uh, relative to duration, 
uh, over the past 25 years, mid 1990s, um, and since March 2020 through May 2022, so this is a 27 month duration, uh, we've witnessed a level of growth two times the prior um, highest growth level, which if you look at the chart to the right, the second bar there, um, illustrating a 54 month duration from January 1996 to 2000. So in summary, uh, growth during uh, this kind of pandemic um, uh, period has averaged over three times higher levels than the prior 290 month average if we go all the way back uh, to the mid 90s. Next slide, please. So the first chart on the left um, is what I'll speak to. So at the same time, over the past 15 months, um, inflation has continued to become an increasingly larger driver of this growth. As of uh, May 2022, year over year change was three times higher than what was the case for March in 2021. Uh, food energy obviously are being you know, a key uh, driver of these increases. Over the past three months, uh, March through May of the data, um, the rate of inflation is growing faster than retail and food service sales. So now if we shift to chart two to the right, this is uh, important to note as the difference between retail food service sales and inflation can be used as a proxy uh, for volume growth. So the past three months of reported data have witnessed volume declines, which hasn't occurred since spring of 2020, um, you know, pandemic beginning in March and, you know, going through some of the initial rough patches in 2020. And as we look at the, the eight month period, which is July 2021 to February 2022, before the decline, um, the average volume growth uh, from the prior year for that period was um, just below 8% and all of 2021 growth average 14%. So the March through May 2022, a uh, three month recent period is averaging negative 2.5% growth as we're seeing a uh, reversal here. So the third chart uh, to the bottom is specific uh, for San Bernardino County. And if we look at uh, performance, it's been in line prior to the pandemic when we look at the nation, the state and the SCAG region. And again, considering retail and food service growth. Um, during the pandemic years, both Riverside and San Bernardino counties saw retail food service sales decline less than 5% versus the SCAG region's negative 12% average in 2020, and both counties witnessed growth near above 40% during 2021. And if we look at uh, a double stack result, 2021 versus 2019, uh, performance is even more pronounced um, considering this. So, um, you know, my opinion is this speaks to kind of varying restrictive policies in the region, across the nation, globally, et cetera, that have impacted supply side, contributed to inflation, other geo geopolitical issues, Russia, the Ukraine war, these things, all these things are having an impact on inflation, global stability, et cetera. Next slide, please. So when we look at e-commerce, um, it's, uh, it's obviously a key driver for last mile deliveries. Um, it's witnessed increasing penetration um, with a substantial uptick in 2020 and then has since flatlined, um, but still maintaining you know, that, that, those kind of peak levels. Uh, interestingly, the pandemic and these other geopolitical events have also led to an inversion for the most recent performing growth rates when comparing overall retail food, retail and food service sales, excluding gasoline stations. Um, E-commerce data is reported quarterly, so it makes sense as these polar opposite results from traditional retail during 2020 are continuing to settle. You know, things are not yet kind of, you know, settled from all, the, all these uh, impacts that we're going through. And collectively, um, you know, all this information uh, displays a, a break from conventional performance over varying periods the past 25 years. And, you know, as I'm, I think the key point here is we're still in a process of figuring out what the new normal is going to look like you know, with current monetary policy, things that are going on, you know, how is growth gonna be impacted for the future? Next slide, please. So when it comes to the lion's share of e-commerce sales in the US, the top 20 companies generated more than 70% of the total during 2020. Uh, the information here includes gross merchandise volume, which essentially um, encompasses either uh, direct company inventory that's being sold or uh, platforms for third-party sellers. Uh, Amazon and eBay are the premier players, um, for the most part, are disconnected from traditional retail store footprints. Um, however, it's interesting to continue to see more companies follow this model, um, including companies like OfferUp, Wayfair, House, Chewy, Etsy, all making the top 10 and 20 lists. 
Uh, for traditional retailers, growth in e-commerce is an indication of the transition to omni-channel service as a competitive approach, and this has been notable uh, for companies like Walmart, Home Depot, Best Buy, and Target. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. Um, so these slides now, we're going to shift gears and try to focus on factors and drill this specifically to uh, San Bernardino and the Inland Empire. So when we look at um, demographics that are listed, this is a table from uh, Connect SoCal, um, the Regional Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy. Um, whether we look at historical or projected information, the Inland Empire has grown and is expected to continue to grow faster than the other counties, with the only exception being Imperial County. Uh, San Bernardino County has witnessed population and employment growth of 31% and nearly 40% uh, from the 2000 to 2020 period. Uh, the county is projected to grow 25 and 28% respectively out to 2045. Next slide, please. At the same time, San Bernardino County has witnessed substantial growth uh, with the county's penetration of the Skag region's overall occupied square footage of industrial facilities from 14% in 2000 to 26% as of the second quarter of 2022. Concurrently, vacancy rates have plummeted to all-time lows, uh, hovering around 1%, resulting from the need to grow capacity to meet increasing demand for consumption during 2021. Uh, there have been recent reports of some facilities being halted and or major facility lessors looking to sublet a portion of their leases as demand has begun uh, to taper off here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, while the last mile is the focus of this dialogue, it's also important to recognize uh, the vast system and supporting infrastructure of the supply chain, especially with respect to the relationship uh, within the Inland Empire. Uh, before last mile deliveries occur, shipments flow through the major gateways, such as Ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, border crossings at the U.S.-Mexico border, Canada, uh, key air cargo facilities, um, as is depicted on this uh, uh, map. There are three major airports that support air cargo free commerce, including Ontario International, San Bernardino International, and the March Inland uh, Port, uh, Airport. Uh, the industrial facilities included here represent the largest e-commerce delivery companies um, serving the majority of last mile deliveries. Uh, as we walk through the next slides, it's important to recognize that there are varying facilities related to supply chain and that the ones that directly connect with last mile delivery services are key to serving the urban areas and communities within uh, the, the whole basin where a substantial amount of population resides. Um, and again, we're trying to illustrate the focus, the extent of these uh, maps uh, to the Inland Empire County, San Bernardino and Riverside. Next slide, please. So this slide includes similar aggregate information uh, with respect to the largest e-commerce delivery companies, but also highlights select delivery locations to depict the relationship uh, for critical facilities that serve uh, these residential communities and businesses within the Inland Empire, including San Bernardino County. Uh, the general hierarchy of e-commerce facility uh, includes fulfillment, sortation, and delivery, with delivery facilities serving as a primary location uh, where these last mile deliveries originate from. Next slide, please. So delivery facilities typically combine interactions between larger tractor trailer drop off pickup to the facility and delivery vans that operate on routes serving the residents and businesses within the defined radius. Um, as an example, a company like Amazon relies upon a handful or more of delivery station locations to serve the entirety of the Inland Empire uh, with Amazon's e-commerce penetration in the US. At roughly one third, there is a correlation with their growth and capacity for their uh, last mile delivery services relative to population employment characteristics throughout the region. Uh, over time, uh, there has been an increasing growth in delivery facilities tied to these e-commerce trends and other fulfillment sortation facility capacity growth. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide includes both industrial distribution warehouse facilities and retail store locations uh, for traditional retailers, including only a, you know, only a few well-known big box retailers such as Walmart, Home Depot, Target, Costco, uh, to represent a subset of the retail total. Uh, the key here is to recognize the green uh, symbology for retail stores as each of these within this subset are important locations with respect to last mile deliveries to residents and businesses. Uh, last mile deliveries uh, should also factor for business to business aspects as well, as this includes much larger equipment and trucks that serve store locations. A uh, key distinction for last mile delivery is the, this point of consumption. Um, so traditionally, 
Uh, this occurred at physical retail store locations and recently has shifted to resident business locations as well. Uh, the number with the number of retail store locations taking them in aggregate, it's very important to still consider the business to business last mile deliveries that are generating a substantial amount of commercial trips throughout the region, in addition to what's occurring in the um, communities. Um, it's also of note to consider the increase in larger durable products that are now being delivered uh, via last mile to residents with respect to furniture, appliances, among other items. Um, so again, the intent here really is thinking more broadly across what last mile is, right, and, and where those points of consumptions um, are occurring throughout the region. Next slide, please. So equally critical is the changing service model to consumers through omni-channel and the increasing competitiveness of newer entrants into last mile delivery space. Omni-channel serves as a competitive approach by companies with physical retail store space uh, by leveraging this space to offer a wide range of services for customers to choose from. Consumers have multiple ways to interact with merchants from traditional in-store to try before you buy, which adds value to how consumers choose and prefer to finalize their purchases. Merchants are increasingly adding ways uh, for customers to experience their purchases of goods from faster deliveries to increasing return options. Um, it's no surprise that many retail store locations are now serving as potential last mile delivery origins to residents and businesses versus primarily serving as a destination for shopping activities as was the past. Next slide, please. Similar to retail, uh, the retail slides, uh, this slide focuses on grocery and food service facilities, including the warehouse distribution aspect and the retail store locations. Uh, for grocery, we, we're looking at just some select companies, including you know, major chains, Albertsons, Vons, et cetera, fast food, you know, in and out, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, et cetera. Uh, when looking to the, these verticals, uh, last mile delivery has exponentially increased led by newer companies, uh, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Instacart, uh, industry, this, this kind of industry um, uh, area here has already begun to consolidate as competition has led to expanding beyond the food sector to pharmacy, other retail areas. Um, combined, uh, grocery food service industries are highly fragmented, especially as a proportion of them are within strip malls, um, commercial streets, et cetera. Um, and like the previous slide, these physical retail locations traditionally involve either grocery shopping in-store, drive-through pickup, uh, with many now serving as locations that are primed for last mile delivery to residents and businesses throughout communities. Um, in either case, it's clear of the emergence of newer business models looking to provide delivery services uh, based on customers ordering online for delivery from physical retail store locations. Um, this is um, kind of an added um, growth area um, in line with the more established model of major e-commerce delivery companies fulfilling an order through the uh, fulfillment sortation delivery process directly to consumers. Next slide, please. So this is the last slide we're walking through for this relationship here of these factors. Um, um, and like the intermodal facility slide, um, just going to bring up the automotive industry, also subject to major trade gateways um, for how finished vehicles um, um, get into uh, that place where they're able to be consumed. I want to highlight again that uh, both uh, Riverside San Bernardino counties have major rail automotive facilities um, as a part of that supply chain. And I think everyone may say, why are we, why are we looking at um, new used car markets as a part of this last mile um, discussion here? Uh, one of the newer and growing areas of last mile delivery is focused um, on uh, th this automotive market, um, and it's lucrative. Uh, the automotive industry is second only to the housing market when it comes to GDP. Um, as you can see in the chart on the right, uh, 53 million units, new and used vehicles sold in 2020 in the U.S., um, carving a niche for e-commerce activities and deliveries is a natural progression that has been occurring across the industry verticals uh, since 2000, as we consider uh, the retail and food services um, data. Uh, so companies like Tesla, newcomers like Rigan and Lucid, they're not developing industrial space for a traditional car lot to sell their vehicles. Rather, they offer multiple options, including pickup from a store location or home delivery. At the same time, newer companies are rapidly scaling last mile delivery services for the used vehicle market, including retail and wholesale. Notably, as the used vehicle market reflected nearly 75% of the total, and uh, OEMs are not necessarily potential customers. Um, 
While this is in a nascent stage, it should continue to be monitored as there are nearly 2,250 new and used car dealer tenants in the SCAG region. Uh, notably, companies like Ford and uh, General Motors are looking to compete and transition their business models as well. So kind of in summary and walking through all this, the key point from this overview is that as e-commerce continues to further penetrate retail sales, uh, the number of supporting, uh, sorry, including omni-channel, uh, the number of supporting facilities across counties will increase in concert. This will continue to support growth for last mile delivery with a continued focus on innovation and technology, leading to increasing number of both industrial um, and retail store locations serving as points of last mile of delivery origins to residents and businesses uh, throughout communities. Um, this is a critical issue to better understand for multiple areas, including technical analysis efforts, such as regionally looking at um, transportation modeling work and how we uh, estimate and assume flows, as well as developing information to help inform policy decisions to be prepared for changes and impacts. Uh, next, you can go to the next two slides. Okay, so this is my conclusion here. I just wanted to give a quick um, highlight on uh, SCAG's last mile freight program, looking at the overview, some key aspects, takeaways, and, and next steps. So the last mile freight program includes two phases. Uh, phase one um, it involves 30 companies that have been awarded $16.7 million to purchase near zero and zero emission vehicles in supporting infrastructure. Uh, companies include independent owner operators, larger companies like uh, Cisco and Pepsi, and a range of smaller to uh, large companies, including newer uh, business models, truck as a service, fleet as a service. Um, and for, San, for San, Bernard, San Bernardino County specifically, uh, we have Wadi V as a part of this program. You'll be hearing from them uh, today, and Pinsky. Uh, these are the two companies that are uh, in uh, San Bernardino County as part of the program. Uh, phase two will look to leverage phase one's efforts uh, by including newer technologies and services such as autonomous vehicles for last mile deliveries, operational strategies related to consolidation delivery, including potential public-private partnerships, uh, combining delivery technologies such as zero emission vehicles, consolidation areas, and cargo bikes, robot deliveries, et cetera, among other concepts. Um, one of the key aspects is the state of California's um, ambitious objectives targeting zero emission vehicles uh, for commercial operations. As we've walked through the review of supply chains and facilities and all this information, it will be important to continue to develop how newer zero emission technologies will fit within the current system, how they will perform relative to the current environment, especially as it relates to costs and return on investment. Um, Example of this is, place, is the potential for placing uh, zero emission delivery vans at a delivery facility. Uh, will these vans be capable of operating on all service routes initially? Perhaps not. Uh, they'll likely need to be worked over shorter routes before it is confirmed of their um, equivalent uh, operational capabilities to expand coverage holistically. Uh, for takeaways, um, from SCAG's perspective, industry is extremely willing to get involved in issues impacting sustainability, partner, participate. Uh, the key need is for newer technologies to be capable of handling equipment, carrying the goods, and that the infrastructure supporting the vehicles is adequate and in place with the ability to scale. Um, key concerns we've heard relate to how public supporting infrastructure will be rolled out how the and how the transition from existing vehicle and equipment technologies to newer ones will be supported. Uh, lastly, next steps. So implementation uh, for phase one is anticipated to begin this summer uh, with project reporting starting next year. Phase two workshops are going to be held in the summer to help frame the approach and call for projects anticipated to occur next year. So that concludes my presentation. Um, hopefully I didn't go a little over. Fine. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, lots and lots of information in uh, in that presentation, and um, I think we'll have lots to talk about. Are there any initial questions before I jump into our next poll? If there's any clarify, clarify, clarifying questions. Great job. I learned a lot. I was taking a couple snapshots. That's, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, that, that bottom, that bottom little first question came up of how businesses and governments uh, can work together. And I think you stated it all right there. So uh, um, yeah, uh, I, I took some snapshots. So great job, Scott. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, well, we will have time again to discuss further um, after our, our speakers, but let's just do a quick poll here before we start our next presentation. Um, so 
what is helping to accelerate advances in the last mile delivery system? Before you've heard anything, we thought we would just kind of get you thinking about it. Autonomous technology, alternative fuels, including EVs, quantum computing, which the dialogue, we had a dialogue on quantum computing. Um, oof, I think it was last year, or we have all of the above and then any others. If you have any ideas out there to throw into our chat, we're welcome. We welcome you to, uh, to see it. I'm sure I share the results. And so um, obviously all of the above, quantum computing is a really interesting new technology that's not quite ready, but gonna be coming out. Alternative fuels, EVs are, are of course going to really change the fabric of, of how things move um, and their relationship with our built environment and our environment, overall natural environment. And then the autonomous technologies, we'll see what happens there. So all of the above, of course, there are no wrong answers. Thanks for um, giving your, your thoughts on this. Main idea is to get thinking before we bring up our next speaker, Bruce Dee Dee McRae. Um, Bruce, let me just share your presentation. And Bruce, I think we're on. Well, cool. thanks everybody. My name is Bruce Double D McRae. I'm the U.S. Government Affairs Vice President for the Western U.S. and UPS is proud to be at the forefront of the companies in our industry working to address sustainability. Well, we've been talking about this for years and I, I like sharing this to start off. Uh, we had electric vehicles back in 1935 in Chicago, New York. So um, they were a lot slower like back then and a lot heavier, but uh, uh, we believe in sustainability. Our CEO believes in sustainability. It's part of our core. Um, so we're excited to be a part of this. Our presentation here is going to overview of how we approach sustainability, how we are executing our sustainability strategies, and how we're helping our customers to be more sustainable. Uh, so next slide, please. I'm clicking along, so don't mind me, because I've got all my speaking points underneath. So. Uh, so as we, in order to understand UPS's approach to sustainability itself, we'll start with a complete picture of what we do. And if you look at that, 5.5 billion packages annually, billion with a capital B. Uh, for, wow, well, it's 495, that's a while ago. We have a little over 520,000 employees worldwide now. Uh, when you think of our vehicles, 125,000 vehicles, 10,300 are alternative fuel, and that was a year and a half ago. Uh, that's moving up as we speak right now with our our new bid on 10,000 new electric package cars that are coming to the United States, and that'll be spread across the U.S. Everybody else says we got to focus on California. We are not the only state that is demanding us to have alternative fuels. Trust me, we're not the only state, uh, and we're not the only counties. But we understand the issues and the needs that we have here. I call it the Valley of Smoke as my uh, Indian friends would, would tell me that's what they used to call the whole in an empire. So we know we have to be our best and do our best. Uh, 572 owned and leased aircraft. When you look at the tons of emissions that have been avoided, uh, that's millions of tons that have been avoided. Why do we do it? Well, uh, it's a must. Why do we do it? I, I'm looking at the faces that are on this call and we have probably one of the most diverse groups on this call when you look at it. Sustainability affects everybody. Smog, if anybody can raise their hand real quick, and I, you know, I'm gonna get off my speaking point here and make this big, since I've done this enough. How many people remember when they had to go to school, raise your hand or put a thing, when you had to go to school, uh, that you had to have a cold cloth on your mouth just to walk to school? I did, I live in Long Beach. I was born and raised in the city of Long Beach. And when my company came out with sustainability and the thoughts of being more sustainable, that's what we have to do. We have over 2,500 global facilities, 28.6 million square feet of automotive facilities. Automation is key. And what does our automation all run on? It's not diesel generated, folks. It's all electric. So the electric companies are our friends. Uh, when people say the AQMD is trying to shut us down, no, the AQMD are our friends because they're looking at what the best interests for the entire state and the entire nation are. Next slide, please. So think of it, I, I, I have to share this. I do have to share this because I'm, I've been at UPS 43 years. It's tattooed on my body. 
I love my company that much. Some people are shaking their head. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I won't show it to you, but yes, it's tattooed on my body. $117 million um, uh, uh, in total charitable contributions. I'm seeing this. Where's the last brown drones, last mile? We have drones. We'll talk about that. Uh, 20 million global volunteer hours. These are goals that have been met. 15 million in global forestry initiatives and tree plantings. Think of all the fires that we have around the United States. A company like UPS coming in and says, wait a minute, we're going to help plant new trees. Trees cost money. They're not free. And our company comes in and uses our volunteers and works with people to plant those trees. 3% improvement in accident frequency. What does that mean? Well, folks, <laughs> turning right, and I, I share this with you, we make right-hand turns. Why? Somebody asked me why. Just, just put up your thumb and I'll, just, I'll tell you why. Because it saves fuel. It's safety-minded. All our routes are generated by right-hand turns. 2% uh, uh, improvement in employee engagement. We talk to our people all the time. And twice a year, we go to our people and ask them, what do you want to see? What are we doing poorly and what can we do to do better? 12% by 2025 reduction in absolute GH, GHG emissions and global uh, ground operations. 25% by 2025 electricity from renewable sources. 40% by 2025 alternative fuel as a percentage of total ground fuel. And 25% in 2020 total vehicles purchased annually that are alternative fuel. We're the single largest user in the state of California when it comes to renewable natural gas. That means all the methane that would be burned off and go into our atmosphere, we're using that to basically supply all our vehicles. And we're using that in California. That's where we push the renewable natural gas in California. Next slide, please. So, but no, that's there you go. <laughs> One million miles driven every business day in our fleet of 10,000 or 10,300 alternative fuels, advanced technology. 1 million metric tons of emissions will be avoided as a result of UPS's 2019 commitment. 40,000 UPS access points. What is that? We want to deliver your packages the first time. I don't want to take them back to our building and have to go out and make another delivery the next day. We want it the first time. And speaking of drones, we're the first Federal Aviation Administration certified drone airline, UPS. That's what we do. We're working with hospitals and campuses right now in regards to, think of it, you go in and, and God bless anybody on this call, I, my family's had it, but you go in to be tested for cancer and you have to have a certain amount of chemotherapy. They have to send it from one group to another. So you're sitting there while they move that blood sample over to the university and back. Well, using a drone cuts that by three, three and a half hours. Well, what's three and a, three, three and a half hours? It's a lot at saving lives. And that's just the start. We're using it in Africa and to deliver blood and to deliver medication in the middle of nowhere. We're using it and testing it in different areas around the United States so our drivers don't have to drive up two and a half to three miles to deliver medication to somebody that's on a farm in the, in the middle of the United States and a drone can just drop it. It's going to work. It is the way of the future. Supporting over 3,500 women-owned businesses. 125,000 drivers wear the new uniforms redesigned to improve performance. And I got to say, if I got to wear shorts and the driver uniforms they have now, I don't know if I've been in management. We didn't have those. We had wool pants and wool shirts back when I drove. So I'm kind of old. 21.7 million volunteer hours. And we keep, continue to do that. And 1 billion invested in employee training and development programs. We have to constantly train. And it's not just training on safety, things of that nature. It's training on how to be more sustainable at home. How do we do it at home? If our drivers leave and they sit there and carpool in and they park across the street to get points coming into our own building, we want them to know carpooling from points in your neighborhood and driving in, <laughs> not parking at the Del Taco across the street. We take it very serious. Next slide, please. Choose UPS. This is something that most people don't know is that we have one package car, we call them package cars, but one, you can say delivery vehicle that delivers all your product. That means your ground product, your second day air, your three day select and your next day air. I have one driver that does that. And I'm not gonna point fingers at any of the other, other companies that deliver. 
we have one driver that makes that delivery, not three and four different drivers making different deliveries to your home. We take a lot of pride. Well, you have to do it that way. That makes you more sustainable when you only have one driver delivering in a neighborhood than four or five drivers delivering in a neighborhood. It's not just about air pollution. It's about noise pollution too. There's so many different aspects that are out there. Yet when you go zero, I'm trying to think what kind of, maybe it's gonna be like the ice cream man because you can't hear the vehicles when they're driving. So maybe we'll have that, you know, a tune playing. I don't know, it's just my thoughts. Please don't, please don't write that in anybody's comments or something, you know, but uh, choose sustainable solutions. Carbon impact analysis, UPS carbon neutral shipping, which we have, UPS my choice. So you're allowed to go on and at UPS, we direct you, come on. And if you can't have it delivered this location, we'll deliver it to the other location. Again, making the delivery one time, UPS access points, utilizing different areas that we can deliver to different stores and drop off your package because you're going to go there and you're going to shop. UPS smart pickup and UPS uh, synchronized delivery. Choose to collaborate. Co-innovation workshops, supply chains, eco-responsibility packaging program. You know, plastics is a... Uh, Boy, that's a piece of legislation going on right now about plastics. Folks, what do we do? And that's where we have to work together, government and, and public sector. Remember when we couldn't use paper bags? Because paper bags was destroying the forest. And then the, the plastic bags that started, you know, I mean, from turtles and, and porpoises and the plastic now destroying, you went from one extreme to another. We went from one extreme to another. Um, so those are the things that we have to work together on. Next slide, please. So again, you can pass this. We just talked about that. So integrated network enables intermodal shifting to maximize efficiency. Again, we use air to ground and ground to rail to avoid more than 15 million metric tons of CO2 since 2015. In other words, putting a vehicle on the road and to drive to you know, the middle of the United States we put them on rail. We're the single largest user of the rail system in the United States, UPS. We're committed to that. But again, what are some of the problems that we have on the rails? If you haven't seen, it's security on the rails. I mean, they're opening the trailers and dumping out a quarter of our container out on the ground and stealing products. That's, that's real life, folks. There's got to be other security measures when it comes to doing business, not in the state of California, but across the United States. Next slide, please. So investments, we have 10,000 all electric vans and custom built by EV manufacturers arrival in North America and Europe. They've already been purchased. They are being built and they're coming here. The first group that we're gonna be utilizing uh, those electric vehicles in San Diego, because we already have and worked with San Diego Gas and Electric and we already have the infrastructure in. The key is infrastructure, folks. Infrastructure is so important. If you're a company like UPS and they're mandating that you have to have new vehicles every year, you have to put on new vehicles and renew old vehicles, you're looking at probably between 12 and 1300 new vehicles a year starting in 2025, all electric. That's just one company. That's just one company. We've already ordered 125 Tesla big rigs. Have we received one? Anybody on the, can you nod your head yes or no? What do you think? Have we received one? No, we have not. We have not received one. We ordered them in 2017. It's 2022. When will we see them? I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, but we are working with other companies to generate and to build new electric vehicles that can test and that can go the miles that we need. You remember when you're using an alternative fuel, let's just say a renewable natural gas, which I believe is a very, very clean vehicle. The bike looking delivery truck. Oh yeah, we'll talk about that. Don't worry, Eric, I'm getting there. Um, when you look at the alternative fuels, what do I have to take off the road then? So if I take off one renewable natural gas field that could go up and down the state, I will have to put on two and a half to three electric big rigs because those big rigs can only go so many miles and then they have to be charged. And it's not quick charging for the big rigs. I call it the big tractor, the big tractors. Um, it's going to take hours to do that. And hours mean dollars and dollars mean bottom line. So that means putting more vehicles on the road because our vehicles run 24 seven in the big rigs. They're constantly moving and constantly going. That's why we went 
That's why we went to renewable natural gas and LNG and CNG, and even looking at hydrogen electric right now. Hydrogen electric doesn't work. Yes, it does. Is it expensive? Right now, it is extremely expensive. Just the test vehicles we have right now, anybody who wants to tag into the chat, what does a one test vehicle cost now? We didn't incur that cost. I got to assure you that working with the AQMD, working with the APA, working with all the different groups, one test vehicle for a hydrogen electric runs about $8.2 million. $8.2 million. Is it the way of the future? If we don't do it now, if we don't plan it now, we won't have a future. And that's why I always state, I love the AQMD and South Coast AQMD because they're not looking at tomorrow. They're looking for my grandkids' days. They're looking for my great-grandchildren down the road. And that's why we have to all be proactive and work together. So pre-ordered, again, 125 Teslas. I, I'm going to leave that one. I'm just going to go because it makes me laugh. Propane-powered engines have been in our fleet since 1982. And now the number is more than 2,400. Uh, next slide, please. So talk about bikes. Here we go. Yes, are they working? Yes, they are. But if you have a, I call it a P1000, which is one of our bigger package cars um, delivering to a business area, <laughs> how many bikes are you going to need to deliver all of those? And now I have to, I, I, I say this openly, what about the safety of those vehicles? What about the safety of our drivers? What about the safety of those packages that we're delivering? I don't know if you've been to the inner cities in Los Angeles and some of the inner cities, when you leave your car door open, guess what? It's okay for somebody to get in it because you didn't lock it. So what happens, folks? What happens when somebody tries to take these vehicles or take this? That's just one. Safety of my people are tantamount to everything. And it worries me sometimes when people say, we want to put you on the inner cities and have these electric bike, bicycles and these bikes going. Great. Are we going to have walking police officers? Are we going to have people out there that can protect my people? We're only one company. The post office does it now, and they walk and deliver everybody's mail. And there's some places the post office will not deliver because of the crime. So that all has to be combined into when we talk about sustainability. If the electric goes down and Southern California or, or, or uh, PG&E because of fires turns the electricity off in those areas and I cannot charge my vehicles and those vehicles deliver diabetes medicine, heart medication, we're the delivery company along with FedEx for all the vaccines. What happens then? Am I going to be allowed to have alternative fuel, other alternative fuel vehicles to make those deliveries? to assure those people get their goods. It's funny when, when somebody doesn't get it because of the power outage or something like that, when a power goes out at UPS, it's horrible because everything we have is on computers. And if the power even fluctuates a little bit, it shuts down the computer. And those aren't coming back on in a matter of minutes. It may take up to a half hour to generate that for our buildings. It's very frustrating. But working together with Southern California Edison, Working together with PG&E, with DWP, with San Diego Gas and Electric, we have to have those relationships, and we do. But the broader good for the entire state of mandating that this all goes into effect now, folks, like I always state, and I'll state it on every call I'm on, if you build it, we will come. If you build the vehicles, I will buy them. But we also need incentives. We have to have incentives from the state because a, a, a renewable natural gas vehicle is probably roughly about $110,000 and electric vehicles upwards of three hundred dollars to $400,000 for one vehicle. If you don't have incentives to purchase those vehicles, you will go broke. And that's for the smaller groups and the larger group. Companies like UPS isn't gonna put on one or two. I wanna put on hundreds in the state, hundreds. And if I have the incentives, I can do that. So please, when you're working with your government agencies, when you're doing that, please let them know, don't just mandate incentives for 50 vehicles and below, keep it for everyone. So the companies that are doing the broad base can get those incentives to buy more vehicles and put them on. That's, that's, that's my share for you all. Um, you know, write that down, please. We need the incentives to go forward. Next slide, please. It's what I got. So I thank you all. And I mean that we're all here for one purpose, cleaner air. And I'm also here for also cleaner water. 
it's about a clean environment and a more sustainable environment that we all have to sit there and say, yes, we need to do it. And it's not just the United States. We have to work with Mexico because you kill right over the border. And how can you be clean in a city that's on this side of the state and mandated it? And on the other side of that small border, they're still burning trash. That's where we have to work together and we have to go out and say, how can we help them too? And a company like UPS being international is there to help. And I bring my cohorts in, I bring FedEx, I bring Amazon. We're all here to do the right thing, but we need everybody's support to do that right thing. We have to educate both Republicans and Democrats on this issue. This is not an issue that is a party issue. This is an issue that's a people issue. And there's some people that are way left to the extreme and some people that are way, way right to say, no, we need oil, we need all this stuff. We've got to come to that middle ground of all of us working together. And, and I don't know if I have anybody from the South Coast AQMD on, that's why I love y'all because you bring us together and we talk about it. And that's what we have to continue to do. Talk about it and come up with a consensus that we can work this instead of demanding it and taking money. And I got to tell you, when you start finding companies, we're going to lose companies. When they can't do it and they go out of business, folks, I was asked once, can you come down to the ports and take all the ports and bring your all fuel vehicles? And I says, of course not. I don't have that kind of fleet. It's not going to happen. That's where we have to work with the California Trucking Association and get them. And Kimberly, I will make that happen for you all and get Chris Shimoda on to talk about the smaller companies and the independent contractors and what they're doing to try and correct this and become more sustainable. So again, I appreciate everybody and thank you for allowing me to be on. Thanks so much, Bruce. It was great. And um, there was a lot of questions here. I don't know if, uh, if we got to them all. Um, you talked a little bit about the future of hydrogen, Steve Smith from... Um, yeah, we're, we're testing hydrogen right now. Uh, that is in the test process right now. We've got to remember, hydrogen is one of the most expensive fuels that you can purchase. I look at electric, too. Yeah. We can come with a parity of electric, gas, diesel, natural gas, and come with a parity where it all, is, it, it all costs the same other than, other than $7 a gallon that we're paying right now. I mean, if hopefully it could be reduced <laughs> to be a little bit better. Um, but that's what it all comes Will UPS be building out their own network to support their EVs? Uh, we're working with Southern California Edison and all the different groups. It's not building our own. We're going to need, we're truly going to be needing the electric companies to come in and do the infrastructure. We're, we're not electric companies. I'm not an electric company. Mm -hmm. Yet, if I'm going to put on 125 Teslas in one building, I would expect the electric company to have the infrastructure there for us to be able to charge those vehicles. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be making the money because that electricity I'm going to have to pay for. So it's like building a gas station, you know, and saying, guess what, everybody, you're all going to pitch in money to build this gas station because you're buying gas for your cars. Well, well wait a minute. You need to buy the gas station and I will come and I will purchase that electricity. And as a company, again, I'm not an electric company. And that's where we have to use the outside groups to come in and do that. Um, and, and to assure that we get a good price. Because when we put on the EVIs in Central California, my electric costs went up almost fivefold, fivefold. Because at that time, guess what? If you use so much more uh, electricity, your costs went up. Well, wait a minute. I was told by the state to use electric vehicles. Well, yeah, but you know, you've gone above that. Well, wait a minute. Then what happens to EVI six months after we purchase those vehicles? Anybody? They went bankrupt. Now I'm sitting with vehicles with no warranties and no background on it. They went bankrupt. Boom. So again, that's why companies like UPS have to look at makers that are there in the long term. And that's why you have Ford Chevrolet. You have these groups that are coming out and now looking at the future and saying, yes, we have to build those because you need warranties. You need backup. And when you only have one, one, an independent contractor that has two vehicles and one has to be electric and they don't have a maintenance person that even understands the electric, they don't have the charging to even charge that electric. That's where we run in the problems. And that's where, again, I've always stated, if government and businesses have to work together uh, to be able to come up with a clear consensus of how we move forward to be a more sustainable state, a more sustainable nation, a more sustainable wor world. 
Yeah. Vote for me. Vote for I, me. <laughs> I know, Bruce, and I'm I'm working on a couple projects here, and so we're going to be in contact with you and figuring out how uh, universities can also help and, and play a role in this. And I, I agree with you. We're also working on a project on the side with the U.S.-Mexican border. I'm thinking it's going to be really interesting when California goes all electric. Where is Baja California and all that? So, but besides that, uh, Steve, Steve, you had your hand up. Uh, did you want to say? Did you want to ask something real quick? And we have a we have a question from Kenny before we move. Yeah, uh, just a quickie again. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, but do you guys have like a position paper or something that puts in words everything you've been saying this morning? You bet. Uh, we do have a sustainability. Uh, uh, statement i'd be more than happy to i'll share it with kimberly and she'll send it out to the entire team yeah you know part of our theory here is that the large trucks will have to go hydrogen smaller ones can a battery electric i mean that gross oversimplification but you know that's how we're getting our brain around this so we're working on the hydrogen part of it if you know hydrogen right now is uh what do they say it's 12 times more expensive uh, than a gallon of diesel. Uh, that's where we have to look at, again, once you build them, once you have more infrastructure and you're making more hydrogen, the cost factor will come down. But remember everything that we purchase and put into our vehicles at a cost, I'm a publicly traded company. So that, uh, I have to make my, I, we, <laughs> I'm a union shop. I pay the highest wages and benefits out of anybody in the United States. We take a lot of pride in that. I was a teamster. But you know something, when the cost factor comes up and it's just on one company, I look at the post office, the largest transportation company in the world. Are they going to be held accountable to do the same thing? They pay no registration fees. They pay no taxes on their, on their, uh, uh, their buildings. They pay no taxes on their fuel. And they, they're my largest competitor. I love them. We do business together. But this has got to be an equity state by everybody. Everybody's got to come to the table on this. Good. Thanks. All right. And I, I invite you all to join us in August because we will be talking specifically about hydrogen in August. So, um, okay. One real other quick one from Kenny Millicon over at Valley College. How many different EV manufacturers does UPS deal with to compare whom is the best to get the most from? We have, we have a whole team that's working on it right now. We have a whole environmental team and, and an EV team that is looking at, uh, and we have to test them. We're testing, uh, we're testing vehicles all around the world. Again, it, it, you know, I, I call it, you know, Michael Holtz, you're now, you're now designing uh, an electric vehicle and you've got a great idea. And our people say, hey, let's test that. You build one, we test it. If it works, guess what? We're gonna build more. Eight times out of 10, these vehicles don't meet the standards that we need because of the miles that we generate. And again, Quick charging, is it quick charging? Are there charging opportunities outside? Can that driver plug that in at different locations they go to? Time is it, seconds mean everything at UPS, seconds. We call it, if we watch our pennies, our dollars will take care of themselves. We have to watch every second and you can't have a driver just sitting there. Much like, no offense, you know, at the port, when you have those independent contractors that are sitting three and four hours in the port waiting, waiting to get into the port, Guess what? They're only getting paid by that one delivery or that one pickup. How sad is that when they used to be three pickups? So again, time is everything. Uh, but we do, we do, we do review. And if you have a good idea, email it to me. I, Kimberly will send out an email to everybody. And say, I'll, I'll, matter of fact, I'll put it in the chat. I'll give everybody my email, my cell phone number. I am here to open doors for you. If you have ideas, I will find the right people that you can talk to. Cool. Thanks, Bruce. All right, well, we're going to move on. We do have time. That doesn't mean um, we're not going to have more you know, time for engagement and discussion. But let's move on to Salim. And uh, before we get there, I have a question that I don't know if any of us really have an answer to, except maybe just a couple of our experts out there. So what, at what point or distance does alternative fuel transport become the most efficient for last mile delivery? And we just threw out some numbers, five miles, 20 miles, 30 miles. I'm in the not really sure. I have no idea, I have to admit. Um, and then we have other, if anybody knows what those miles might be, uh, please let us know. I'm gonna let everyone see what everyone said. So let not- me, 
like, sure, most of us were in that not really sure zone, and we all try and think about what you just said, because it is a complexity, and, and you really need to, to get to that nitty gritty to understand how the system's working. So um, these aren't these aren't super, super easy um, pieces. You know, I, I tell my students all the time, everyone wants the black and the white, <laughs> but the reality in the world today, we don't have a lot of black and white. We have all kinds of shades of gray. <laughs> so <laughs> it's figuring out those shades of gray. All right, with that, I'd like to invite our, our next and um, our next speaker to come up and give me a second here. Let me just do this. Doing it right. There we go. There we go. Um, Salim, you're, you're welcome to. Uh... Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Salim. I'm the CEO of Wadi V and uh, happy to be here today and walk you through what we're doing and how we're uh, really changing the way that transport is done and making um, zero emissions transport affordable and accessible to all. Uh, I wanted to start off by really um, talking a little bit about the ecosystem. So if you go to the next slide, uh, obviously diesel is one of the major, if not the largest source of, of urban air pollution. Um, you look at the San Joaquin Valley, uh, there's tons of emissions that are flowing there. If you look at you know somewhere closer, like the ports, Port of LA and Long Beach, we can see the emissions coming in and how it affects the entire valley. So it, it's definitely not a matter of if, but when this transition needs to happen to zero emissions and uh, about how we can make that a possibility. Um, on the next slide, a little bit about the sustainability pressures. Uh, obviously there's all sorts of mandates that are coming out, uh, not only in California, but other states. Um, California is definitely leading though, and, and uh, we can see that not only in, in um, the port areas with some of the regulations that they're enforcing, but even on the warehouses, like the uh, indirect source rule that's coming in the south coast uh, AQMB in, in Southern California region, as well as other areas. Um, and then obviously there's the sustainability goals that a lot of corporate companies have and the demands from a lot of the customers to start adopting um, cleaner uses of, of transportation. On the next slide, um, there's the obvious economic burden. Um, a lot of it comes down to infrastructure and the cost of the trucks. I mean, on, on the infrastructure side, it's, it's definitely costly. There's a lot to manage on the uh, cost of the equipment, as well as on the uh, grid and, and utilities. On the vehicles, um, it's no surprise that the trucks are expensive, almost three to four times that of a new diesel truck. Uh, yes, Tesla has posted publicly their prices online being at par with diesel, but where are those trucks? When are we going to get them? I mean, we've reserved those trucks as well, but there's no commitment to a delivery date and, and we can't afford to wait that long. Um, the next slide touches a little more on, on those barriers. Um, obviously, there's the, the costs and there's the uh, public funding. Yes, it's, it's definitely needed that we have the, the public funding is available like HIV that, that pays for a portion of the vehicles or the different grants that California and federal uh, grants have for, for bringing down the cost of infrastructure or fleets, but we need more. I mean, it, it takes a lot to get us to a point where it becomes um, you know, at, at a large enough scale where the costs are low enough to be cost competitive with diesel. Um, and then there's the limited range of the vehicles. Uh, a lot of the, the current uh, um, vehicles that are out there have about a 250 mile range at full weight and about a two to three hour charge time. As uh, Bruce mentioned, time is money. We can't have drivers sitting waiting for a truck to charge two to three hours. So our, our model looks into how we can reduce that time. And then obviously there's the unknown residual value. Class A trucks is very new to the market. Uh, we don't know what the residual value is of that vehicle after six to seven years. And then there's the lack of infrastructure. So what is it exactly that WADIV does? Well, on the next slide, um, we do both. We build out the public infrastructure needed to make zero emissions trucks a reality. And then we, through our electric truck as a service platform, put electric class eight trucks on the road to make it more affordable and accessible to owner operators and various carriers that don't necessarily have the capital requirements to one, build out the infrastructure at the facilities or two, get access to electric trucks to operate them. <clears throat> on the next slide, a little bit about the um, 
society impacts on the drivers. So on the vehicles, all of the, the reports that, that uh, the drivers have on these vehicles is positive. They instant a driver gets in the truck, they, they fall in love with it. It's smoother, instant acceleration, less fatigue on the, uh, on the body. They can go longer, less vibrations, and then the obvious no emissions. Um, on the next slide, you, you go two slides. Uh, so on, on the infrastructure piece, Wadivi is building out in publicly available infrastructure, not only in California, but nationwide. We're starting with California, obviously, because of the incentives that are here that help us bring down the cost. But uh, we have nationwide goals and are already evaluating and, and are very active in the states that uh, are adopting similar mandates and incentives that California is doing. And we're looking well beyond just the current capability of the vehicles. So most of the uh, trucks that are available today have CCS charging, which is 250 kilowatts at most, and uh, goes, equates to about a two to three hour charge time on those vehicles. But MCS, which is the megawatt charging standard, allows us to rapidly charge those vehicles. And we see that as, as a, a requirement to really mass adoption and scale. Yes, our model can, can allow us to operate trucks on short haul, middle mile, and long haul, but really to rapidly scale this, MCS plays a big role. And uh, we're working very closely with a lot of the OEMs that have that in, as one of their um, future developments or on the road now. So in terms of our expansion plan on the next slide, um, this year we are working on five sites. So we have our Bakersfield site, San Bernardino, Gardena, and Long Beach and our evaluating sites going all the way up to Sacramento, which would allow us to create a fully zero emissions corridor that we can deliver freight from Port of Long Beach area to Northern California. Uh, we're also looking at going eastbound. A lot of that traffic goes into New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, all the way up to Chicago. And that's a very, very big route. Um, yeah, a lot of those states don't have the incentives, but we need to be there. Um, we also see autonomy paying playing a role down the road. Some of those other companies um, are looking at uh, adopting autonomous vehicles on diesel and then on uh, electric as well. Um, on uh, the next slide, you can see our, our dedicated routes that we're starting with. So Bakersfield, this is a site that's uh, large enough that allows to put solar. Obviously, wherever we would go, we can't put solar to reduce our energy as much as possible. And that so those sites will be more dependent on utilities. But for the most part, we can't depend on utilities entirely for the infrastructure portion. One, when, you, when, we, when we go to them and ask for the power at our sites, it takes time. Some of those sites may not have the power requirements that we need, um, and they need to do upgrades. That costs a lot of money, and that costs, uh, costs a lot of time as well. Um, but on an average basis, we see that we can have our blended cost be lower than the utilities. So blended means the combination of all of our solar sites, our battery storage, and the utilities will allow us to, on average, have a lower price of energy compared to a lot of the, uh, the utilities themselves. The next slide is, gives you a pictorial of what Bakersfield looks like. So this is a 115 acre property of which uh, 100 acres would be all solar at the, at the final scale. So that's 40 megawatts of solar along with battery storage and that equates to 200 trucks per day. Um, right now we're, we're in development in the first phase which would be five megawatts of storage, five megawatt hours of battery, uh, five megawatt hours of battery storage and five megawatts of nameplate capacity and that'll equate to well over 60 trucks per day. Um, the site will have CCS chargers there installed initially and be upgraded to MCS when that technology becomes available. And we are evaluating um, all of the hardware providers uh, for charging and actually designing our own to be um, more future-proof and allow us to really dynamically allocate how power is shared among CCS chargers and MCS in the most efficient manner. The next slide is our San Bernardino location which is also right off one of the major freeways and very close to a lot of the distribution centers in that area. Um, this site will also be a depot for CCS charging and MCS opportunity charging as it develops. Um, this is a smaller site compared to our Bakersfield site. This is only about four acres. But again, you can see that we can fit 
a fairly dense amount of chargers in that small, small footprint. And then the final site that I want to show is our Port of Long Beach site on, our, on the next slide. Um, this is about a one and a half acre property located right in the ports. So um, being right in the ports is, is a crucial part of, of actually being able to have electric trucks um, used in those areas and being able to um, drive to some of those lo other locations. So how does this all work? Um, what we see is that the infrastructure is definitely required for uh, truck, trucks to be, uh, electric trucks to be adopted and used. But what about the vehicles? What about the range? What about the driver, the, uh, the companies that can't really afford to buy their own trucks? And that's where our, our truck as a service really plays in. So for instance, um, if a driver comes and picks up a truck in Long Beach and does a trip from Long Beach to uh, Inland Empire, that's about a 75 mile trip. Yes, the truck has enough range to do that. But what happens if a truck is going from Bakersfield to San Bernardino and back? From Bakersfield to San Bernardino, that's 165 miles. And by the time a truck picks up a load from Bakersfield at one of the distribution centers, goes to Inland Empire, that truck is nearly out of charge. So rather than having a driver sit two to three hours for a truck to charge, they can pull into our depot, pick up a fully charged truck, and then do another load on the way back. And this becomes more of an optimization problem on how we manage our assets, uh, where they're, they're located, and how we do the ma route matching to guarantee that a truck is always available for a driver that needs to pick one up, and that the routes uh, and, the, and the infrastructure that we have can allow for those drivers to meet those routes. Um, and then it really allows us to reduce the total cost of ownership for that driver as well. So if you look at the total cost of ownership um, in the diesel world, it's made up of the lease or financing of the vehicle, the maintenance, insurance, and then the, the largest one being the fuel. Uh, in our model, it's very much the same. So the electric trucks are obviously a lot more ex expensive, but by having those dr vehicles driven more miles per day, we can bring that down that total cost of ownership as much as possible. And by having it, our trucks in sort of a shared pool in this relay model, we can optimize and make those trucks increase the utilization of those assets to really bring down the total cost of ownership as much as possible. This obviously comes down to a lot of the software. So on the next slide, um, we have a lot of software that's being developed to really create a fully complete ecosystem from start to finish of how a user is able to pick up a charged truck, um, how we're matched, they're matched with the loads, where they're gonna charge and everything so that they can have assurance on all aspects, on the reporting aspects for the shippers that have to comply with indirect source rule, we can provide them a summary dashboard of the electric trucks that are coming to their sites. For customers that are, don't necessarily have the capital to buy the trucks, they can join our platform to now have access to that relay model. Or for some customers that want dedicated assets or charging at their facilities, we can work with them as well to whether it be develop the infrastructure at their facilities or give them dedicated trucks and, and create a model that works for them, works for us, and, and still gives them a lower total cost of ownership compared to diesel. Um, on the next slide, again, it talks about the, the sustainability product uh, and how we're really reducing emissions. So on an example trip uh, of, of, of replacing 100 diesel trucks per week on a 160 mile route from Long Beach to Rialto, this equates to well over seven, or about 17 tons of GHG reductions annually and 1.7 tons of NOx reduced annually. And this is only a drop in the bucket compared to the total amount of, of diesel trucks in operation, but it's a necessary step. And as we scale up our infrastructure, we're able to go well beyond the short mile, the middle mile, or the long haul freight. And as the truck technology develops and as MCS becomes available, we can start you know, even looking at models where rather than replacing, the trucks are now being charged and drivers don't necessarily have to swap trucks, but they can now afford to wait that 30 minutes to charge a, a, an MCS capable truck and be on their way. Um, on the next slide, again, it's just a, a summary overview. So, the truck as a service concept that we've developed. Um, we have uh, 50 trucks, 50 Volvo trucks that we've placed an order with that will be delivered by the end of this year that will go into this uh, truck as a service concept. 
Um, and we have plans to, to buy a lot more. Um, we have plans to, do, to purchase another 250 next year and are evaluating all of the OEMs and their goals towards uh, reaching MCS capable trucks. Um, on the infrastructure as well, we have very ambitious goals well beyond the five that are in development. We already have a pipeline of sites going all the way up to Northern California, as well as uh, locations on the East Coast and other states that are looking to adopt uh, similar um, incentives as California. Um, and then uh, obviously on, on the uh, TCO side, the total cost of ownership, we're able to lower the total cost of ownership by maximizing the utilization of those assets. So the more miles driven on the, tr on the trucks, the, the lower the total cost of ownership becomes. And in some cases, especially now with current diesel prices, we are actually better than diesel. And then through our truck as a service uh, software, we're able to give an all-inclusive um, package to the driver that includes the vehicle, the maintenance, partial insurance, and the fuel being the charging of the vehicle at all at a fixed price through our truck as a service and our public charging. Um, I think that's the last slide. Uh, welcome any questions and uh, looking forward to your comments. That's great, Salim. Thank you so much for sharing uh, what, what EV is doing. It's a, it's a really interesting model, it's a new model, um, what's happening in the world today, bringing all those components together. Um, are there any initial first questions before we go into our last one? In the chat box, Professor. I see, I see one on, on uh, AC versus DC. So these are all DC fast chargers uh, that we're putting in initially, um, 360 kilowatt chargers. And then uh, as our, our dynamic charging technology becomes available, it'll also be uh, 250, 240 kilowatt chargers and then uh, MCS chargers as well. So these are all DC fast chargers going in. So I mean, this is Bruce. Uh, are you working, who are you working with? PG&E and Southern California Edison in those areas of, of their Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the location, obviously. But uh, yeah, Long Beach is Southern California Edison, San Bernardino as well. Um, Bakersfield will be our solar as well as PG&E as a backup. I'd, I'd like to introduce you to some of our people at UPS. Uh, open that door for you to talk with them because it, it's funny. We, we're finding in some of the areas that they can't upgrade us. They have to put a whole new infrastructure in uh, because of the amount of electricity we need in our buildings, yeah. uh, which again is that's not a million dollars. That's that's tens of millions of dollars, even yeah. even larger uh, for some areas. So uh, it's just interesting to see how you're growing and and what you're doing when uh, it's tough and, for us. And, to, and this is to this is new for happen. the utilities as well. I mean, right? If you look at they they have different incentives themselves, like the charge ready or make ready program. But when you look at the details of it, it still really has a lot of room for improvement. And one case especially is if you look at our Bakersfield site, we have di uh, distributed energy resources, which is the solar and the battery. But we want the capability to have shared between that as well as the, the uh, energy coming off PG&E. But the contracts may not necessarily allow it to allow you to have DER. Right. So there's a lot of nuances that have to be worked out and we are working all the way up to CPUC level to, to make these changes a reality. Um, we have one last question, I think, for you. If you're if you're working, if you're building out a network, yeah, so work with all electric vehicles or just your own product? It will be all electric vehicles. So we are OEM agnostic. Um, the reason why we purchased Volvo was for a number of reasons, but we evaluated all of the OEMs. Um, all of our stations will have CCS chargers and uh, MCS when that becomes available. And that's one of the conversations we had in another dialogue last year and talking to, um, to Volvo Lights and, and other contractors that are working within that overall project is, you know, the great thing about America is that we have a lot of options <laughs> and we have a lot of different technologies that are going out there in that competitive environment. But the bad thing about America is that we have too many options sometimes and we build out a lot of duplicative kind of networks and using different technologies. You know, we've all been in our, our friend's house and needed a cell phone charger and they just don't have our cell phone. And that difficulty because their cell phone charger isn't gonna work with our cell phone charger and thinking about, you know, 
making sure we have these technologies for charging up our vehicles um, on the road and how do we make those decisions as well. Okay, I'm gonna um, just really quickly do our last poll, which is actually, uh, hold on a second, let me get this wrong. Um, uh, our last poll is, uh, it's, just, it's just open for discussion, but I wanted to start our conversation just on this, how do we optimize the new networks and what are the optimal solutions um, to creating efficient and effective last mile service. So I'd really like to, um, I'm gonna close this. We don't really have a uh, open for discussion. We can hit that button, but I'm gonna end this poll and just say, let's open that up. How do we optimize the new networks that exist out there and what are the optimal uh, solutions to uh, creating a more efficient and effective last mile service? Anyone want to start? I guess I guess being realistic and not and, and truly being realistic of what can be done instead of looking at what ifs. I mean, we have to look at the hardcore facts that it's expensive, very, very, very expensive, um, and it needs a buy-in from you know local, uh, county, state, uh, all different agencies. Again, the incentives and uh, Salim, like, like you stated, the incentives that we need, if you're going to have vehicles there that, again, people will come in almost like, a, uh, oh, you know, the, the, the cars that they put on the side of the road in, in New York, that anybody can go to that car, you put it in your cell phone and you can drive. I own all our vehicles. So I, I, I own every vehicle we have. And when we have vehicles that come over the border, now remember, the state of California is looking to to not allowing any vehicles in. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you go from a, a biodiesel renewable natural gas trying to deliver goods into the state when you may not have chargings in Arizona, you may not have charging in Nevada, you may not have charging in the states that surround our state. Mm -hmm. um, again, these are what ifs. Uh, who knows? I mean, this. <laughs> I've got two more years and I'm retiring. I'm not going to say it's not my issue. But it is my issue because I'll still stay stay hot on this to make this a reality for my grandchildren. But this is something that we all have to look at as a group. And that's from the, to the left to the right. What is reality? Are they making the vehicles? Every vehicle I get to the team, I have to test. I've already been down that road. I've already been down the road with one company that we purchased pretty quickly and put on and worked with our governor and worked with the EPA and worked with a number of people and they went bankrupt because no one else was building them. So this has got to be a nationwide group effort of stating where are we gonna get the electricity from? Is it gonna be all solar? Uh, what well, we're not getting it anymore from Nevada and we're not gonna get it anymore from Arizona because they stated that they're not gonna be giving us any energy. You look at the water, what we have right now, folks, uh, I dream that we have some type of water solution um, where we can build those reservoirs back up because I'm frightened. I, I really am. This is not something that I, you know, I can get a serious face right now. I'm truly frightened for our future. We're demanding everything right now, but where is it going to come from? It can't come from coal burning plants back in the East that generate coal and natural gas to make electricity so we can be cleaner. So it's got to be all of us in on this. And that's, again, I always go, it's got to be government and businesses and, and our public working together for a common cause. So Kimberly, I'm just going to say, I'm for sustainability. My company's for sustainability. If you build it, we will come. If you build it, we will buy it. But I'm still frightened because it's not happening as quick as it needs to be. And you can't be demanded to do something when it's not there. And those those companies get charged and get taxed and get feed because it's not there. Yeah, that's great. Um, so a lot of the there's a question from Gerald about the electrical infrastructure upgrades to support mass commercial EV adoption. And Southern California Edison, I don't know what PG&E is doing, but we've had Southern California Edison here as well to talk about um, their programs and Salim and, and uh, Bruce have talked about this. Scott, I don't know if you have any insight into what Edison's doing in our region. Um, 
but there are there is a build out and there's some support that Edison is providing for companies. Um, it's, I'm not sure exactly how that's working out and we were going to bring Edison back um, next year, I think, as we're already full for this year's topics. But Greg over there, he's the one who's, <laughs> who's holding the purse money that's helping support this. So um, Greg, we have to talk about, you know, if we're gonna have another infrastructure on the electric grid um, and what that means. But that also goes into a question of, um, I see that you're kind of building Salim microgrids um, Bruce yeah. said you're not an electric <laughs> electricity company. Um, Scott, do we have any? So I'm just going to ask out. Scott, do we have any maps that really show the microgrids that are coming up within the across the across Southern California? So I'll throw those out for you. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't have actually um, access to that information like today, but that's something we can follow up on for sure as part of the kind of different data elements we're looking at. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, it would be an interesting piece to add in there of what's, what, what microgrids are being built out, who's doing what, and how will that support the overall system? Salim, do you have any? Sure, yeah, just to add on that, I mean, going back to optimization, there's a tremendous amount of room for optimization on the infrastructure side as well as on the vehicle side. And it does take a lot of effort from all parties to make it happen. Um, when we were in the research phase, we, we did a lot of research on the California ISO. And believe it or not, California has enough solar to make it happen. But the problem is routing that energy. A lot of the energy that we produce with solar gets curtailed. It just gets dumped because the grid can't handle it. The utility lines are either congested or they can't take it at that time. So it just ends up getting wasted. Um, and, and you know, for a number of reasons, we, we can't just in, depend entirely on that network. We can't depend on when it's gonna be upgraded, how it's gonna happen. Um, and that's sort of why we've been adopting these microgrids. Um, and a large portion of, of what we're doing is, is site selection and, and strategically being able to identify the sites that work for us, whether it's, it's you know, entirely utility tied or has that uh, distributed energy resources like Bakersfield does. Um, so there's there's a lot that goes into it and, and being on, you know, whether it's the, the major trucking corridors or being close to the end customers in those distribution centers, there's a lot that we we have to do to, to really make it happen and make it a reality. Yeah, and so I just want to follow up with that. And I know I know my 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 colleague over at Valley College, Kenny, had a question before I get to his question. I wanted to ask you all briefly about um, working within the United States. And so the state regulatory environment versus the federal regulatory environments, and how is that, um, you know, how is that impacting or how is that coming about for you in the build out or thinking about um, you know, a new system? Because I, I, I'm working with some colleagues uh, as we are developing a proposal right now from Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And we've been having conversations about this east-west corridor, and we know um, from our colleagues over at the Department of Transportation at the state level and thinking about the build-out of the 10 freight corridor and what that means. Um, but from my, from my you know, university's perspective, they're like, well, in Arizona, we're not doing much on this. In Texas, no, nah, we're not really thinking about it. So what is what is some of that regulatory piece across states, but also at the federal level, meaning for for you all as you as you move forward? I mean, all, all of the sites that, that we have, we've applied to some sort of grant funding, whether it's state or federal. And I, I'm sure as we expand, we're continue we're going to we're going to continue to do so. Um, some of those states don't necessarily have those incentives there now, but we can't just ignore them. Uh, we have to be there. And not just because of the economic reasons, but for the, the social impact that it has. I mean, at the end of the day, we need to make it possible to move freight efficiently using zero emissions trucks from one location to another, whether it's in California or in another state. And on an average basis, we can really lower down that cost for those states that don't have those initiatives or those incentives. I, I agree with Selena. I mean, it incentives are so key, so key for any company that's going to purchase an electric vehicle. Again, hundred and ten thousand dollars, three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars for one vehicle. That doesn't include the infrastructure, 
and the needs of the me mechanics and the maintenance, even though there's less maintenance. So when you look at that, where do those companies like UPS uh, or anybody, you know, a small mom and pop, where do they get that? If, if they don't have incentives, even the, the minor tax incentive, Kimberly, that if you have a $120,000 vehicle and you're buying a $400,000 vehicle, maybe the tax that you, you know, it's like buying a $120,000 vehicle and that's what you get taxed on. That's safe. Yeah, that's, that's something that we're actually extra bitter about because at one end, the California is giving you money and on the other end, they're taking it. Yes. So it makes no sense. So, so they're giving you money to buy it, but then you have to pay the taxes on that four hundred thousand yeah. dollar vehicle, and they're getting it right back. So you're like going, "Wait a minute, it, it, it's, I, uh, yeah, I'm a, yeah." All right. Yeah, I feel your pain on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, any thoughts on on? Uh... No, yeah, yeah, I think, I, I think, you know, this conversation is great because from our perspective, you know, we view our, we view a couple things, right? Like we, we ingest a lot of data, we do a lot of analysis, we, we look at long range, you know, trajectories of growth, all these things. But now we're also kind of immersed in this um, implementation opportunity through the last mile freight program working, you know, with, with, you know, a lot of companies that are talking about the same thing. So the perspective, the issues, thinking about like the reality, the practicality of transitioning, how do we really accomplish these things? This is an area where we see tremendous opportunity to take what we learn over the course of these next couple of years. And we try to like help inform policy, help inform um, the region to understand what's going on. And I think the key theme, one of the key themes is like, you know, we have a system in Southern California, that's a subset of a bigger system of global supply chains and national relationships of how goods move. And that's a critical area where, you know, we hope to, to kind of bring some, not, you know, insight directly, but to just bring perspective on, on what all this means and, and how to engage a dialogue better. And, 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 and SCAG really creates a good forum to try to bring all this together, to bring the region together, especially public and private stakeholders. So we're really working hard to try to, to balance things and, and to, to focus on the key issues and what is the right approach, what's practical, you know, because you've got a lot of politics involved, you've got a lot of positioning involved that are just saying we need to do stuff, we need to move fast, but we have to move effectively. So the economy can thrive, and so um, the communities can benefit, right? So that, I think those are kind of critical areas to, to kind of focus on these efforts. Thank you, Scott. Um, Kenny, I know you had a question out there. I thank you for waiting. Do you? I know you're also- uh, Hi, I'm Kenny Malasa. I uh, work at San Bernardino Valley College. Uh, there's quite a few questions I have, but this may not be the meeting to bring them up, but. You know, it, it's beyond me on, and I hear the prices of these trucks, 450,000, uh, 500,000. Uh, how can that be when it's actually cheaper to build an electric truck by components? I mean, you're taking out engines, you're taking out transmissions that cost a tremendous amount of money and you're putting in an electric motor, a couple of solenoids, a couple of computers and calling it good. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, equal in my brain. I don't know. I, I think different than others, but uh, I love you, Kenny. I love you. I'm just going to say it right now. I love you, Kenny. <laughs> and, and that's just one point of view. I, I think I'd like to see a pennies per mile. We buy trucks like not we or uh, where I came from. I came from a truck manufacturer and we was involved with many, many people that purchased those trucks and everything was rated pennies per mile for 200,000 miles. And I'm sure UPS buys them the same way. So does Omnitrans and everybody else buys the buses, it's pennies per mile. And the fact that you don't have the maintenances, you don't have the oils, you don't have the belts, you don't, you do have brakes, you do got bearings, you do have air conditioning. There is some maintenance involved, but that just got cut in half by going electric. Now, the, the idea of all of us are buying vehicles, we don't have the technicians to work on them that are certified to work on high voltage vehicles. Anything over 50 volts is considered high voltage. The United States is behind big time in that. 
no technician certification whatsoever for anybody to be approved to work on these vehicles. I, I appreciate y'all going electric, I really do. Uh, I'm on the maintenance side and that's where I see a lack of it. And uh, the, the only thing that we actually teach over here is a lot, a lot of safety. Uh, our electric, our EV classes are safety. We teach how to do uh, installation tests on electric motors. And that's it as far as EV is concerned. So uh, again, the, the maintenance is nowhere near what it used to be uh, for a motorized vehicle. Uh, so I don't see, don't, I guess, let me back up. The only way I see this is getting more expensive is we going autonomous. We going with satellites monitoring everything on a truck, which is to me is, I, I guess it's okay. Uh, but it, it's, if y'all, if we're being charged for those options, we ought to have the opportunity to say, I don't want those options, you know, because like UPS and other companies, they have their own system to monitor their trucks. They don't need what comes in the truck. So if that's cost, cost cutting, then they should be removed. Uh, but anyway, that's just my point of view. I'm going off on something that's way different on the conversation, but uh, that, that's kind of what I see uh, out in the industry today. Thank you. Hey, I, I got to add one thing to that one too. Um, what are we going to do with the batteries when they're, they're done? I mean, what oh, do we do with little batteries now? As well. Yeah, I mean, no one knows. No, no one knows. And look at the fires that the Tesla vehicles have had, things of that nature. You can't put those out. So you have an electric vehicle, it's, it, you know, being tried, at least, are, again, these are what ifs. I'm not stating this is going to happen. But what if one of those vehicles catches fire when you're charging it in one of your big facilities? And guess what? And I'm putting it out. It's all aluminum and it's all going to start melting just like the Teslas do. And they, you know, there's, there's, I mean, I'm just thinking of the infrastructure of the safety side of foam retardant that has to come down on everybody if a fire starts. I mean, there's so many different aspects of this that no one is looking at. There's a state you got to have it. Okay, well, if there's all charging out there and I've got to charge 135 vehicles outside, where am I going to get the property to charge those? Because I'm already based in my property. I already have a property outline. Who's going to sell me more property, put all those vehicles on that charging infrastructure on? I can't stop my facility from running right now, but you're going to have to dig holes and dig trenches and run lines. Where am I going to do that? And that's just one company. We've got to work together and come up with ideas that this is a process of going forward, yes, but not a mandate at this year, you're going to have this many on or we're going to tax you. But you already tax me when I buy the vehicles, right, Celine? You already give me the incentives, but then you tax me. So now I'm going to get double taxed. Oh, I need coffee. <laughs> it's only money. You got to get on to pot two, Bruce. Pot two. Um, I have well, another question, but I'll. Oh, I'll is that what you say? I mean, <laughs> there are other questions. Kimberly's telling me to smoke a dude. What was that? I got to get on pot. What? I didn't say that. We're in California, man. It's we're all kind of relaxed. Other questions out there before I ask my question? We all got the cannabis pills for our dogs, but you know. Yeah, we have in the chat box a command professor hmm. from Gerald. Yeah, we're still waiting for the, we're still waiting for batteries. The batteries is the big issue, but I know that our colleagues over at UCR and some of these other, um, Great facilities are working on battery issues. Rafi and I were just over there visiting CSERT and looking at their, their pieces. Um, I know that, is Todd still here? Todd, are you there? Todd, where are you? Todd, so what's going over at AQMD? Well, it's uh, all clean fuels for us. Uh, it is, and much of it's actually coming uh, to the Inland Empire. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to see. I put a clip in there uh, from back in 2013 uh, when Mr. McRae actually had some uh, hair uh, 
<laughs> you remember me back then, huh? That's right. They are, actually, he looks, looks better now than he did then. Uh, but they had a, that's when right there at Tippecanoe and uh, Orange Show was the uh, first uh, UPS uh, EV uh, trucks uh, right there at the old uh, UPS facility. Ironically, right next to a school, I think it's Victoria Elementary, is right on the other side of the, uh, the docks. Uh, so it's a, it, this is very much uh, something that is important to us. And UPS is walking the walk, talking the talk, and uh, uh, Mr. McRae is uh, heroic and uh, making that happen. And I love hearing this. Thank you, Tom. Um, I also wanted to bring up just another piece on geography. So how does geography really impact our, our last mile decisions? Um, from Salim, if you have any pieces, or, or Scott, um, so in the geography of the area, I noticed that, you know, that picture of that bike is in Seattle, of course, you know, in Seattle, we're even groovier than us down here in SoCal. Um, so what, is, what does geography mean for you all? Location, location, location. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, because one of the pieces about the Inland yeah. Empire is how large it is, the spaces between our, our small or our urban cores, you know, spaces within our, within our suburban environment and how we can really create more efficiencies with the geography that we have. Um, I don't know if any of you are working on that or thinking about that. Any, any large transportation company, again, like, like UPS and FedEx and Amazon, it's all hub and spoke. So to install our hubs and how far we can go out uh, bef before we even return. Remember, my dollars aren't made on delivering packages. My dollars are made on picking up packages. So the people that I pick up from are the ones that pay, and then we just go out and deliver. So I can only go out so far uh, fuel-wise and, and hourly-wise to bring those vehicles back in. So I think the Inland Empire, because of the railroads and because of what we have out there, more people want to build out there. I live in the flight pattern of Long Beach. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of 12 that got to sue them. Uh, and I didn't sue them. A lawyer came to my house and told me I can make 250000 per occupant of the home. I'm going, woo! -hoo! I was just married and I went with it. Um, and, <laughs> and we ended up we ended up pulling off. But again, you have to look at where you live and where people build. And I think that's where South Coast AQMD and some of the environmental groups come in. It's okay, now wait a minute. If you're going to build a home, home structures here, you've got to look at what's surrounding you. And then they come in and try to stop you from doing business. We've had that happen many times at UPS. But what, what makes us better when I go into new things? Can you assure us that your operations will be electric or a portion of your vehicles coming in to be electric? I think that's how we that's how we initiate growth now in those areas by having people state that yes, I will put on 20% of my vehicle since I'm building straight up. You have the ability to put the infrastructure in when you're building those new new places, right? So when you're mandated to state that you've got to have a portion of your of your 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 building be generated for electric vehicles, or you don't get in. God, my boss is gonna hate me on that one. But it's true. When you think about it, if you're going to build something, do something for the communities that you're a part of. And I think that's just the way of the future that we grow. And when we're expanding, that we have to assure that we're gonna be used. And uh, folks, I'm not gonna say just zero emission vehicles, alt fuel vehicles, alternative fuel vehicles that are not a, a, a gasoline or a diesel or a diesel, since that seems to be the, 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 the call here. Um, that you have to use an alternative vehicle. If we were able to use an electric hybrid, and that means an electric hybrid that's it, it's got a, a gas engine or a diesel engine that charges those batteries, how many of them do you want me to put on because they're working around the world right now? There's companies that build those right now. But you have areas that want zero emission. Well, maybe we'll start looking at grids and say you can't come into the city of Los Angeles unless you're 100% electric. We have the technology. I can put the technology into my vehicles right now that says once you go past this street, guess what, you're on electric. Once you leave that street, that charging, that engine can charge those batteries where I can go all day long delivering instead of having to stop and pull in. Oh, wait a minute, this is just a Tesla charging. I don't have that plug. Oh, wait a minute, this is just a, a bill of mobs charging. I don't, like you said, Kimberly, 
that's happening right now. Yes, it is. So. I have a I have a quick question that we discussed in uh, our last meeting for the dialogue for the dialogue the subcommittee, uh, and it's for all of the uh, for Mr. Scott, Ms. Mr. Bruce, and Mr. Salim. Uh, before even thinking of the electric vehicles, the substitute uh, uh, energy, uh, we were discussing the network part of it. If you remember, Professor like how these companies can collaborate together and exchange data and network uh, using uh, computing and technology in order to share this uh, delivery distribution within California and make it more effective and efficient as an operation before, before even uh, jumping to that part of the conversation. Rate, so rates, 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 routes, and services can never be discussed between uh, um, companies. It's against federal law. Uh, I thought some shippers do partner, though. I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a few that I know some of do, that do share the, loads. Yeah. The, lar the, the large ones can't. So I'm just going to pretend I didn't hear it. We can't. So, but yeah, some of the smaller independents, yeah, that that work together, uh, absolutely. Um, but the yeah, rates, routes, and services we're not allowed to discuss. I see. Interesting. Okay, I'll leave that. Um, Steve, you have a question, and then uh, let's see. If yeah, just quickly, you know, in a sustainability. Um, a session like this, I'm hesitant to bring up roads, but um, you know, and we're we're doing as many people know here a ton of work on transit and uh, multimodal. You know, we're very very much more multimodal than we were just five years ago. Uh, but um, from a last mile freight perspective, there's still a bunch of bottlenecks out there. And even though, you know, we're trying to be sensitive to uh, incentivizing transit, you know, the, the efficiencies, the turn times, the fuel uh, consumption, all of that goes into trying to fix some of these hotspots. And we put a ton of money into uh, interchanges along I-10 and I-15 and other uh, places. It's one of those things that even though drone delivery might offset that a little bit still it's all based on the distribu distributed uh, system we have you know very uh, geographically dispersed which triggered this question Kimberly uh, we still need to pay attention to that otherwise you know we got other issues I, I agree wholeheartedly for the one company the one representative representing companies that came out and supported SB1. That was a tax on fuel. Um, and everybody says, why are you doing that? Because I tell you what, if those dollars go directly to the infrastructure, I am going to triple the savings just on my tires, just on my tires from getting destroyed on, on the poor roads. So Steve, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Infrastructure is one of the largest needs that we have. And when I met with the Secretary of Transportation uh, a month and a half ago in San Pedro, I told that's, I mean, look at the budget that we have, the budget windfall. It's got to go for infrastructure. People are still using their cars, folks. No offense. People are using their cars. I mean, they just, I, on a Saturday at 10 o'clock, it takes me two hours to get to LA to see my son. And I've got a full car. I've got five people in my car. And there's, we counted them. I don't even think we saw more than two people in vehicles. The roads are still full. Yep. They're still full. They are. Greg, you have any comments on, on infrastructure? Well, I, that was uh, a question that was going around in my mind for our, for our panelists. And that is um, more along the lines of, of what uh, Bruce was just talking about. Where are the champions? Where are political leaders and champions here? Right. You can take a trip up to Sacramento or you could have the secretary, you can have Tokes come down to San Pedro or, or, or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, is this really where they're where they're showing their 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 priorities? Uh, we had a presentation today by the, the um, by Caltrans, who has a new director now. Um, and he said the three priorities are equity, sustainability and um, safety in that order. 
that was interesting to me. Um, and because it was, I suppose you could, you could layer infrastructure in there, right? But, you know, but he did, he did say, I'm sorry, he, he did, he did say that that's in addition to maintaining what we have, right? So I guess that's the answer. They're not focused on building new, anything new, but hopefully a good, a good portion of whatever surplus we have can go towards maintaining our roads because they're so important to our, um, the infrastructure is so important to our economy and our quality of life. Mm. Anyway, my question is, where's the, where are the champions? You know, where, where are our champions at the, at the state level to, 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 because the state that can't do it all by themselves. I, I was one of the ones that said, it's gotta be a mixture of the two, but private sector has to take the lead, but we have to have the support from our government officials. Sorry, that was long, Kimberly. <laughs> it's all good, Greg, great to hear from you. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm looking for the champions as well. I'm looking for those who are going to come out and, and really provide that leadership, not only regionally for our communities, um, but also, you know, thinking about it at a, a state or national level. And as a, as a socio-political scientist, I have a, a lot of thoughts on thinking about, um, you know, what is the future look like in, in developing really secure, uh, you know, uh, equitable, sustainable, resilient communities um, with the number of challenges that are coming down um, within our 21st century world we are living in today. And where is our 21st century governance along with that? I don't believe that we can continue working with 19th century and 20th century institutions when we have companies such as Watt EV, <laughs> It's really working. If you look closely at their model, that is a transformational model on bringing in new technologies and really rethinking how, um, how the workforce engages with the um, infrastructure. And then looking at some of these, you know, more stable, I, I, I'm not, I don't know how long UPS has been around, but a long time, Bruce, right? And so, you know, some of these longer stabilized big companies, worldwide global companies, and how they're really thinking. And is government keeping up? And it's, a, again, a piece for me, um, and as my students are in the room, to really think about, because many of them work at the local government level, how do we make these changes? How do we see that government can go forward to be a true partner and also be a leader in rethinking how our institutions are working? With that, I will thank you all so much for being here. Um, it was a great presentation. I've learned a lot. I think we need a part two and to continue on the discussion on this one to really get a, a full grasp and hold of everything that's going on there. I wish you all the best. Um, stay cool, it's hot, at least here out in the IE. And uh, we'll see you at our next dialogue in August. Where we'll be talking about hydrogen technologies and bringing on government as well as private sector or companies that are working within that field. Thank you.